Okay, everybody back? See the top of breakfast? <laughs> um, okay, today we're uh, going to look at theories of disaster risk uh, reduction. And with that, maybe take a look at some of the development stuff as well. We're going to discuss disaster risk reduction and development uh, next week, but maybe as an introduction to the theories relating to that. So, <clears throat> in terms of the session outline, so, well, I have one administrative thing that I just quickly want to go through. Um, then we'll have an introduction. Uh, then we'll look at the sustainable livelihoods framework. Um, then we'll continue with the uh, pressure and release model. <coughs> and then spend some time on some of the development theories if we have time. Okay? Um, first, what I would quickly just want to um, look at is in your study guide, in some way, there's been some of the mess up regarding the resources. Okay? So there's one resource that is not included in here, but I'm making available for you on the um, screen. All of these that are relevant will be made available on the screen as well. But you just need to go to the compulsory reading for the first part. Um, the first uh, source. Um, adopted. And that is basically just an application of the model, uh, of the framework in research. So we'll talk about the framework and you'll see that there's some very, various options that you can use it in. This is an application in terms of research. Um, then the Hendrix one, the second one, is specific. I'm sorry. It's a bit, yeah. Yeah. The uh, Unclear urban women versus men. Yeah. Look at it. It's a thing when you try to find it. I don't know anything about this. But I'll be. I'll be nice and put it on the Okay? <laughs> One of these things I'll try and put on the phone because I have them. So why not make it available? Okay? So um, Hendrix is a specific application to disaster risk reduction. You'll see why this is important just now. Um, Brock. Alexander, I might mention the model, but I don't think we'll see it. Discuss the model. So, I'm going to 
I'll try to make most of the things available to you guys so you don't have to search too much. You can start searching a lot when you're busy with your assignments. Okay. So let's quickly go through an introduction. Um, what's important in this session is for you guys to keep the, the concepts and the things that we've been talking about in the past session and the, and the ones before in mind. <coughs> Specifically, the interaction between these concepts because you'll see that these models rely quite heavily on the interaction between the different concepts and therefore try to explain the context within, um, within that uh, situation. Also remember that we said the definition for disaster risk reduction um, is the, it's a concept and a practice of reducing disaster risk through systematic efforts to analyze and manage the casual factors of disaster. <coughs> now, the things that we are going to be busy with today relates to the efforts to analyzing and man managing the causal factors. Okay, so we'll, we'll try to discuss a bit about how you identify them and how they function. Um, sorry, I'm just thinking, I didn't check. Are you guys administratively fine? No issues, no hiccups that you need to... Yes. No? Also, yeah. Yes. Um, she's asking if we put the if I put the presentations on Ifundi, I do. You'll see that in each unit, I know that this unit um, is not necessarily structured as a research methodology one, but I do put them on Ifundi in a PDF. So you'll have access to that. I know that for the research methodology, um, the presentation with the topics are all on there. So you can go and take a look at that. I um I oh, can't see the part here. I, I the okay. Any other issues? Okay, great. Oh, everybody's fine. For now. Um, okay, so... Sorry, I interrupted my train of thought here. Okay, so there's also risk reduction um, in Wizard at all the 2012... Oh, that's the other thing. You mustn't get confused between Wizard at all 2003 and 2012. 2012 is a, a book that they wrote on also on vulnerability things. Perhaps also a good source for you guys. A bit heavy, but the hand um, of hazards is also risk and is also risk reduction. This is also a nice one to actually refer to. So this this could be an additional source. Okay. <coughs> so they say that there's also risk reduction is a process of understanding analyzing and managing the cause and origins of disaster and the risk that accumulates and lead to disaster. So it's all of these different things that disaster risk reduction actually tries to do in order to reduce the risk. In that. These models and frameworks that we are dealing with today um, aims to aid this process in various ways, either in analyzing, either in um, managing or either in identifying cause um, and origins of disaster risk. Okay. So what's important in disaster risk reduction is that no one person has the skill or the knowledge to actually implement the RR effectively and successfully. So this process relies or has to be at the end of the at the end of the day a multi-sectoral process um, and effort. With that we mean that it must be vertically and horizontally multi-sectoral. In other words, on a local level, horizontally, including all of the groups and, and um, organizations and institutions that relate to this issue. Horizontally in the sense that on a local level, on a district, on a provincial, on a national, on an international level. Okay, so it has to be a cross-cutting multi-sectoral effort. Um, then the process requires also expert outside knowledge. Which is sometimes a difficult thing, and we'll see in the development theories why people are but either hesitant or either extremely acceptant of this knowledge. Then the other thing that it also requires is local knowledge. And if you think about the interaction between the scientific knowledge and local knowledge, it's also an interesting one. 
And then also the process um, naturally involves a wide variety of groups and stakeholders. So if you think about this disaster risk reduction process, it's quite a broad, um, extensive process that incorporates a lot of groups and a lot of um, stakeholders. Okay, so we have to keep that in mind when we're busy with the process. It's all also impossible to separate disaster risk reduction from other processes like development. And that's why I'm speaking a bit about that today and we'll continue with that next week. To see how these things influence one another. Also climate change, those type of things. Um, they interact with disaster risk reduction as well. And they um, overlap to some extent too. Okay, so when we're dealing with disaster risk reduction, um, a few questions about this extensive why process kind of um, gets asked. First of all, how do we understand this complex um, environment? How do we know how to identify different things within this environment? And where do we start? Because it's such a complex process. Um, then also, how do we find the solutions for this complex situation? Because there's so many different elements in this process, so many interactions between various dynamic um, <coughs> concepts. How do, you, how do we understand this and how do we get to solutions regarding or strategies regarding these issues? So one way of doing this is the use of frameworks and models that have been developed in a holistic manner taking into account of things. So if you're, for example, trained as economy, when you enter the disaster risk reduction complexity um, of complex uh, environment, you are immediately going to relate to that things that you have been trained in first. For instance, myself, I'm a communication, um, I've been trained in communications. When I enter into a situation, the first things I observe are communication related issues. I've been trained in that. So what does the frameworks and the models actually provide for people like me and like yourself? We cannot necessarily train in all of the, the disciplines that are involved in disaster risk reduction. The key here is that these frameworks and models allow us that are um, trained in a specific area to remember to ask certain questions. It raises issues regarding the disaster risk reduction situation that you're dealing with that you wouldn't necessarily think of because you're trained in a specific area. Does that make sense? Okay. So, not, lots of nice clever guys have sit, sat and thought about this and put together these frameworks and models for people like me that are not necessarily um, uh, able to view this in a holistic manner because of my time. So, um, in that way, frameworks and models allow us to form a type of holistic view about the reality <coughs> that we encounter around us. Um, but also important is that there's not necessarily one model or one framework that incorporates everything. Okay? So it's usually the best thing to use different models and different um, frameworks to analyze a specific situation. And with people coming from diff different disciplines, it's usually easier to do that because you can rely on the strengths within different disciplines to actually describe a certain situation. Okay. So, <clears throat> What is the Sustainable Livelihoods Framework and where does it come from? Now firstly, the Sustainable Livelihoods Framework's origin is in development. How interesting is that? Eh? So it started off as being a tool that the Department for International Development actually developed um, based on the research and the work they have done to develop sustainable livelihood approaches. Okay. So, Sustainable, there are many sustainable livelihood approaches. The framework is just adapted um, as a tool to actually describe these sustainable livelihood approaches. So the sustainable livelihood approaches is seen as a way of thinking about the scope, the priority and objectives for development to better poverty alleviation. So it was created initially to address poverty alleviation. And you see some cross lines actually coming into disaster risk um, reduction and management issues that we've been discussing relating economic vulnerability and those type of things. So it was initially created for that end. Um, 
And the aim of it was, of the sustainable livelihood approaches, were to actually <coughs> better development activities. To at the end of the day, um, achieve better development um, objectives. Okay? And more effectively. So how did they do this? Firstly, by a systematic analysis of poverty and the causes. So, systematically um, addressing this issue of poverty. Then, um, by a wider and more informed view of opportunities in development. And then uh, um, placing people at the center of this analysis. So this is the key for the framework as well as for the approaches when we look at sustainable livelihoods. is that of the human-centered, the um, people-centered approach that impacts. Okay. So the sustainable livelihood approaches, now don't get confused between the framework and the approaches. The approaches function with specific principles, but they relate uh, or they um, flow into the framework as well. So, first of all, the first principle that the sustainable livelihood frame, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> no, I get confused, approaches actually function by um, is that of a people centered, of people centered approach. Okay? In this way, like I said, they ask the questions, remember we also discussed this in the previous session, they ask the questions about what, what matters to people, what, are, what is important to people and to protect. Um, and also, they take the differences into account between different groups and between persons in society. Okay, so that's one of the principles that the sustainable livelihoods um, approaches function with. The second one is responsive and participatory. So it has to be um, uh, responsive and participatory. Responsive in the sense that it responds to those things that um, people in the situation indicate. So it responds to those aspects. Participating in the sense that it includes these people as people as a people-centered approach, it includes these people um, and uh, the issues that they deal with and the per per uh, perceptions that they have about certain things. Then the third one is um, it functions in terms of a multi-level uh, or, or it functions with um, the principle of multi-level. Um, as well. What this means is that um, in, in these approaches we look at um, multiple levels, uh, macro and micro. So not only does it um, describe and try and account for the larger macro levels, national, international, maybe even district level, it goes right down to the local level, so I'm trying to describe the local levels as well and what people uh, <coughs> on the local level as well and what people are facing and um, dealing with in their daily um, living as well. Then, um, partnership is also an important one, principle that also functions on. It aims to create and describe and manage the partnerships between the different groups in this um, environment, in this context, and describe the strength of it and how to better it and how it influences one another as well. And then, of course, staying true to the, to the name of the framework and the approaches, um, the sustainability is also a principle within these approaches. Of course, it doesn't help if we only have a quick fix for a specific issue. So the aim here and the principle whereby it functions is to create long-term strategies and to ensure that those strategies are not only just a quick fix for the current situation. And then the last one is it takes into account the dynamic um, side of all of these concepts as well. Like we discussed in the previous sessions, and I'm sure that you discussed this with, um, with, with Devon and uh, Kyle as well, these things change constantly. So the sustainable life here, its approach is takes into account this change and this dy um, dynamic aspect of, of the things that people deal with. And specifically in terms of the context, but also in terms of the um, expressed commitment people have to this to this process. So it's not just a thing that we're doing a week and then it's done. We actually kind of observe changes throughout the period of time. Okay. So these principles are also um, were not addressed 
favor in terms of the framework as well. So keep that in mind when you're dealing with it. Now why are we looking at this framework specifically for disaster risk reduction? We'll get to the link between development and disaster risk reduction next week. But for now, important um, is to um, know that livelihoods make up such a big aspect of people's, uh, or such a big part of people's um, financial and economic environment and the things they rely on. So it's important for us to understand this and what influence, influences this. Um, as we have seen and discussed in previous uh, sessions, it's often according to livelihood strategies that people perceive risk and decide where to stay and how to stay there and so on and so on. So it's with, with this livelihood aspect, which is the lifeline of, um, of economic benefit and financial income, um, that people make their decisions regarding risk and the environment. Um, so it influences therefore people's decisions regarding this risk. And then disaster risk often threatens people's livelihoods and the sustainability of it. So it's necessary for us to actually um, uh, regard or look at this aspect, consider this, um, to know in what way it's threatened and how does this work. There might be influences that we don't know about that might be threatened by disasters and by hazards. Okay. So it's important to understand what influences this, uh, the livelihoods of people um, to understand and describe the risk that they face. So that's the link between the livelihoods and the livelihoods framework and then the disaster risk reduction process. Now the framework itself. <coughs> um, the sustainable livelihoods framework is analytical too. So it provides a way of thinking in a systematic way through different influences on livelihoods. And it also ensures that important factors are not neglected. Remember what I was saying about the communication practitioner and the econo uh, economist? So it allows us to make sure that all of the important aspects that we need to consider to describe the situation is in there. It also provides a structure that can be used to understand life. So according to the structure, there are certain things that we come to know about livelihoods. And it's also to understand influences people, uh, what influences people's livelihoods and how they develop their livelihood strategies and outcomes. And we'll talk a bit about this concept or these terms um, when we discuss the points. And then in the process, identifying key um, pressure points for potential impacts on livelihoods. So by looking at the structure in the system and receiving information from the environment um, around people with this structure, we can now see, oh, but this area is, um, is at risk in some way. Okay. And then form our strategies also accordingly. The framework is supposed to be dynamic. So indicating external influence and taking into account the decisions that people take themselves. So the framework um, incorporates people's decisions as well. So you can see that this framework isn't necessarily something that you can at all do without actually um, involving people that, that you're trying to determine the risk of. Okay. <coughs> so, with regard to that, the, the framework then um, describes the following things. First of all, the priorities that people have. What do they prioritize in terms of strategies? What do they prioritize in terms, in terms of outcomes? Then the strategies they use to address these priorities, it describes those. We can determine certain information from those strategies and in, with our interaction with the framework. And then it also describes institutions, policies, and organizations within a person's household framework or livelihood in the environment that they live. And it also adds to that by saying that, or, or indicating how these different organizations, institutions, and groups influence the access people have to resources and opportunities. Okay, so it describes that as well. 
Then also it describes the access to various assets and how they use them, how people use them. And then of course the context in which people live. Um, the graphic representation of the model looks like this. I think um, we'll discuss each element of it and then come back to the model and then we'll see how it relates back to one, back to one another. Okay? First of all, the vulnerability context. So here we're talking about things in the broader um, environment that people do not necessarily have control over. Things we look at here is trends, shocks and seasonality. Trends in terms of population, uh, governance, resources, those type of things. Shocks um, in terms of things like, for example, sudden economic change, something like a disaster happening, those type of things. And seasonality in terms of employment opportunities, maybe agricultural produ uh, production. So those type of things that people don't, don't necessarily have an individual influence over or can control. Um, do you see that this is more on a broader uh, level, a macro level? System, uh, uh, processes that happen um, in the wider environment of people. Then the second one, uh, the second uh, concept we look at is livelihood assets. Now this is quite an interesting part because uh, this aspect of the framework is usually, or sometimes, not usually, sometimes also used to describe and analyze vulnerability of so. Um, livelihood assets refer to the assets by uh, asset base people rely on, in other words, the capacities within the system, the things that they, they have currently as resources. <clears throat> Here we look at things like uh, human capital, um, things like training, skills, health, nutrition, the individual human capital that someone possesses. We also talk about social capital, or we ask questions around, uh, around social capital. Informal safety nets, networks, the ability to work together, to organize oneself, memberships of organizations, all those social aspects to a person, the assets of that, or to the, the household. Then we also um, look at natural capital, things like land, water, and air quality. Um, Physical capital, like transportation, roads, structures, those type of things. Financial capital in terms of savings and credit, the uh, financial um, uh, backfall that people have. And then sometimes um, political capital uh, is included. It's not part of the original um, uh, livelihood assets. But sometimes it's included specifically in places where there's conflict, for example, um, or where pe people might actually um, have access to a specific political structure that is an asset. So you look at power structures and human resources. Now, like I said, not only um, is this part of the livelihood, uh, the sustainable livelihood framework to describe the assets people rely on. But it also can be used to determine the vulnerabilities of the place in terms of the various um, categories. But also, this allows us to describe not only the assets that people have, but also their access to these. Okay. So we can ask questions around access as well, regarding the different categories and the different um, categories in terms of that. Now, um, the next one we look at, next concept we look at, is that of the transforming structures and processes. So here we also look at um, processes and structures on a larger scale that people use as a guide to actually form their strategies for uh, um, achieving their livelihood outcomes. So these influence how people use their assets to form their strategies. And people will use them to plan around them to make sure that they, at the end of the day, um, achieve their outcome. So here we look at uh, things like structures on a local level, structures on an international level, um, and national. And also we look at laws and cultures and religion. 
how people arrange themselves or strategize around these things to achieve what they need to achieve. <coughs> and then the last two, it always feels to me that, like they start, that they start the framework backwards to front. It feels like you should start with the outcomes, but I understand why you first need to understand the different parts. So the last two aspects of the sustainable livelihood framework is that of the livelihood strategies and the livelihood outcomes. So the livelihood strategies refer to the choices people make in order to achieve the livelihood outcomes. And livelihood outcomes is then the aim of the specific person at the end of this process. So what happens is we look at this um, from my point of view, let's say for example, my outcome would be to buy a car. Or let's say my outcome would be to increase my income to buy a car. Then I need a strategy towards this. There's different things influencing this strategy. My, my um, religion, my culture, what's acceptable, um, laws, um, you know, I can just walk into the to the road and just take one if I want to. But there's certain things that guide my strategies in terms of law and, and legislation and so on. And also the moral aspects as well, but that comes in with different things. So, <clears throat> so that is my strategy. And then if we look at the broader uh, framework, um, I rely um, on my, or I relate my outcome back to my assets um, in determining my outcome as well. So there's different things that I consider when I develop my outcome. So that relates back to your assets. Let's say for instance I've saved up for ages. So I have access to specific capital right there to achieve my um, uh, livelihood outcome. So I would then apply that as a strategy to obtain that. <clears throat> um, but then also different processes and structures have an influence on this as well but they relate again back to the, to the broader aspects of the vulnerability complex so they feed into that again as well and according to that I um, determine my livelihood strategies and plan for my um, livelihood outcome does this make sense? If I send you out now and say, take this and analyze that situation, will you be able to do that? <laughs> no. Okay. So I'll come to it a bit with it. Um, what I can say is, is read the two cardinal documents because they, um, they developed this. This is also interesting because they, they, they developed the framework and the license and strat uh, uh, approaches. They've written a lot about that, but there's different organisations that have used this and adapted it to their context. So Oxfam has done some of, uh, some of this. Care has also done some of this, um, where they use the framework and apply it to different situations and then write up what they found. Um, some some people actually use it for product uh, project implementation, and with that they they. Uh, change the framework according to their context and what works for them. And they include stuff in it uh, that is relevant to their context as well. So it makes it quite a nice framework for people to use in the, in the um, field. Any questions? Okay. So that brings us to the pressure and release model. <coughs> now, in the previous session, we spoke about risk is created by a combination or is the product of the interaction between vulnerability and hazards. So, um, no, I think it's also in at risk, the, thing, uh, the document that I will put on the you guys. They explain in saying that um, this process and interaction explained by saying if you have theoretically, if you have vulnerability, at zero, so zero vulnerability, and there is a natural hazard or a hazard crossing. 
they, will, they won't be a disaster because there's no vulnerability for the house to be destroyed. If you have a but if you have vulnerability but you don't have a hazard, there's no, we won't be talking about this here and here. So those two things are, are crucial in the process of disaster, in the process of um, determining disaster risk. So it's those different things that we spoke about um, engaging with one another. <coughs> So the pressure release model, and I put models here because it actually, you'll see it's two models um, that describe the opposing sides of the, of the um, picture. Um, it is used to indicate the interaction between the different um, concepts. So it's something that shows the progression and how these things build on one another to create a certain thing. Um, the pressure release model tries to show how vulnerability that is exploited by hazards can exist and create underlying causes and be created by underlying causes. So it tries, in, uh, it tries to look a bit deeper at this interaction. And then um, the um, pressure release model is a, uh, a disaster, a disaster is, uh, or, sorry. It functions from the premise that a disaster is the intersection between the things that cause vulnerability or um, um, attribute to vulnerability on the one side and the hazard on the other side. So <clears throat> in terms of that, they say that all of these aspects go on one another with the hazard from the other side and it's where these two forces intersect where you get the disaster event. So, the aim, therefore, is, uh, and the focus should be on the, when we're strategizing to reduce risk, should be on the release aspect of this model. To see how we can actually um, avoid disaster events by looking at the various components of the model. So this is how it looks. Remember I told you that in um, KB1, or conceptualization of disaster risk on your fundi, uh, you'll find the categorization of different hazards. Now, as part of that, this model is also included and described in there as well. Now, um, it's, it includes various um, <coughs> parts, um, such as root causes, dynamic pressures, unsafe conditions, and then the disaster event, or where they intersect, and then on the other side, the hazard. So it's drawn up in the, in the idea of the pressure and release model where there's two different forces going towards one another. Let's do the same as the previous one and discuss each of the elements on their own before we get to the whole one. So root causes. Root causes are, are the things and situations that are most removed from the disaster point uh, or the point of, of intersection between the it's the interrelated, widespread, and general processes within a society and the world. So it's something that people might not necessarily consider as being part of creating and maintaining vulnerability. But if you go back, you can see that it actually contributed to the impact of the results in the Now you remember, um, those of you who were here, uh, that I drew the tree on the board, with the roots and the branches. Now this is exactly what it is. It's the roots of a problem. Where does it come from? Where does it originate? And, and they say that, um, that it can be removed from disasters in terms of different things. First of all, is spatially. So it might be removed in the sense that in this local, or something's happening outside or on a higher level than this local community but it's impacting directly on it and creating certain circumstances okay might be temporarily distant, um, distant in the sense that it happens within time it might be something that happened in history that now has an impact on people currently okay um, and it might be just plain in human existence things in cultural beliefs and religious that people don't necessarily draw directly as part of disaster risk and as part of this interaction, this intersection, 
but it might have a different impact on them. And I think now about the example that you guys did about the uprisings last week, and this is quite, this is also something that, uh, well, this is a good example of that it's religious and political um, things that reside in different systems, but now it's an influence on vulnerability and that's an influence on the impact of a specific measure. Okay. Um, the, the main areas that we look at in this model when we, when we discuss root causes is that of economic, demographic, and political processes. These are usually the main ones that actually create um, and maintain vulnerability, and therefore they have mainly to do with the allocation and distribution of resources. So it's how people decide. And in that deciding, there might be something that has an impact on people causing different situations. Okay. Um, and it's also connected, if you look at the political processes and maybe security processes, it's, always, it's also connected um, to how a state functions or not function um, and how military and police uh, and, and practice control in a certain area. Right, so that's my things that I've influenced there. If you look at the at the graphic representation now, um, root causes originate from things like limited access to power structures and resources. Okay, um, and ideology, certain things that that like political systems or economic systems that are in place that influence different things. So the idea here is that this this is the um, point where it, where it originates, where certain things originates to have an influence on future aspects. Okay. So they relate then um, and combine with dynamic pressures. Now, dynamic pressures is, a pro is processes and activities that escalate and translate the effect of root causes into unsafe conditions. So, if you think, if you look at this. Uh, at the diagram, <coughs> we have the third one is unsafe conditions. So, root causes and dynamic pressures interact to create unsafe conditions. Um, dynamic pressures, pressures are not necessarily or log logically a bad, um, a bad impact or have a bad impact or a negative impact. Um, if we think about, um, uh, about rapid urbanization, for example, or urbanization, or rural to urban, uh, urban urbanization, uh, migration, sorry, um, then it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's the interaction with the root causes that, that create the negative effect and the negative impact. Um, so, because uh, rural to urban migration happens due to economic uh, inequalities um, or social inequalities. People move then um, from that areas to urban areas. Uh, some root causes might have an influence on creating a safe, uh, an unsafe condition when they move there. Okay, does that make sense? Um, yeah, so they interact with one another. Um, okay. So when we look at unsafe conditions, it's now the product of the interaction between root causes and um, dynamic pressures. It's the way in which a population's vulnerability is expressed when considering the hazard as well. So here we look at vulnerability to to what to what hazard. So it incorporates and takes into account and the hazard as well, to express or to describe um, what people have to deal with then. So in terms of the unsafe condition, it's expressed in either where people work or where people stay, or the things they engage in, unsafe behavior and, and risky behavior. So these could be, for example, living in unsafe areas. People move from um, rural to urban areas, uh, because of economic inequalities or economic issues. Um, and now they get to the urban areas where they do not necessarily stay in safe areas. 
or afford um, safe buildings. And these are then seen as the unsafe conditions that we can face. Also, the lack in, protect, uh, in the protection of the state, um, forced, and people are forced to engage in da dangerous livelihoods as well. So that would be things like poaching or um, illegal mining and that sort of thing. Illegal mining has been in the news quite some the, the past couple of weeks. So um, those can then be described as the unsafe conditions that people face because of certain aspects when we look at uh, dynamic pressures and then root causes. So that can be related back. Um, if we look at the diagram, um, it could be examples of this could be a fragile physical environment. Unsafe places where people stay, low lying areas, or in earthquake, uh, uh, places prone to earthquake, uh, earthquakes. Um, a fragile local economy. Some aspects may have caused this um, unsafe condition in terms of um, a fragile economy. So there's, you see that, that there's uh, origins leading up to a specific situation or unsafe condition. And then public action, lack of disaster preparedness, prevalence of endemic diseases, those are the things that we see as examples of that. Okay. So if we look at, at the pressure model, um, all of these things built up in terms of people's vulnerability to either act with the hazard and then the hazard exploits this creating a disaster uh, a disaster impact at the end of it. Okay. And then this is the release model. So what we're trying to do in disaster reduction is work the other toward the other way. To lessen the site or, or to lessen the unsafe conditions, to make them safe. But we cannot do that without taking into account the dynamic pressures that, that combine with um, root causes to cause unsafe conditions. So what happens usually and, and often is that people see a situation, um, take the Britia South situation. Um, people are staying on Dolomite area. First solution, they have to be removed. They have to be relocated. That's it. That's the only plan that we can have for that, for that area. But we're not taking into account the dynamic um, pressures that actually translate into this unsafe condition. We're not taking into account the root causes of this um, situation. Yeah. So it's, it's important. So what happens? We just move people and then other people move in. So the risk isn't reduced in that context. So it doesn't help us just addressing the unsafe conditions. You have to look at all of the things that precede the situation and to address the origin of it and actually reduce the risk regarding that. Um, also, on the other side, people tend to work toward reducing the hazards as well. If we look at human-made hazards, it's be something that people work towards. Um, but at the end of it, the main idea and the aim is to not have that intersection situation where the vulnerability is intersect with the hazard and we have a huge impact, which, which is the disaster. Okay. Um, also, importantly about this, this model is that um, there's not one single cause that leads to a specific effect. So, in other words, I cannot necessarily say that. Um, Lack of access to political structures causes uh, unsafe conditions such as selling and unsafe housing or something like that. These things are a lot more complex than that and they um, escalate into different ones as well. So they have an influence on one another too. Okay. Any questions? Yes. Just a little bit. Uh, 
So you'll be fine doing this for an, an, an analysis. <laughs> okay. Um, it's at some stage uh, it becomes all um, overlapped and intertwined, and it's difficult to kind of um, distinguish sometimes as well because these things overlap. But using using a, a systematic way of doing so might might assist. Some of the highlights as well. I mean, the Comments or questions? Okay. Now, I'm 
just quickly want to spend some time on development as an introduction to next week's discussion about the link between development and disaster risk reduction. It's important to understand what the approaches to development had been in the past um, to understand how people actually um, approach development and disaster risk reduction today. So if we look at the definitions of development as a process, it almost almost always involves a change. So if you think about development, it almost always triggers something of motion, something moving, and something changing as well. Okay. So Gardner and Lewis, uh, who are anthropologists, um, they define development as the process whereby certain actions bring about posit positive change. Okay, so they, it might, it, we might end a little bit earlier. Okay. So, <laughs> really? Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so in terms of Gardner and Lewis um, define development as a process whereby um, certain actions bring about positive change, evolution, and progression. Um, Mumeka said that change, uh, it's a change for the better in both individual and society in terms of socio-economic, cultural and political circumstances. So something has to happen to bring about this positive change. Where does this idea of development come from? And I apologize if I'm boring you with modernization. <laughs> okay, so modernization had been, uh, or the modernistic approach to development had been followed um, in 19, between 1945 and 1965. Um, the focus here was mainly on economic and industrial development, um, and this happened mostly after World War II. So what happened is the United States developed their Marshall Plan, and they implemented, uh, implemented implemented it in uh, Western European countries to assist them to recover after the war. So they thought that this, it had worked so well in the Western European countries that they thought, but let's use this model of the Marshall Plan and implement it in third world countries um, to ensure development uh, and to ensure them becoming as developed as the first world countries. So they thought that it was simple. It's applying te technical knowledge pl plus um, implement better scientific methods plus uh, or that ends up um, creating increased production and with that comes stronger economies. So there we are the better. Um, the outcome reached, everybody's happy. So they describe this process as a linear process. We put this in, we add this, and then we end up with this. Because it worked in, in their Marshall Plan, <coughs> to some extent. But, like we you know, this wasn't the case um, everywhere else. The attitude that was followed was, we know, we're going to teach you. You don't know, we know. So it's a very egocentric uh, type of attitude that um, was present in the modernistic approach. The critique on this was that only focusing on financial and economic aspects creates more inequality and leaves developing countries um, worse off than before. Okay. So the issue with this was as well that the modernistic approach to development did not take into account um, the context and the environment of the different countries. And this created a problem. So, because initiatives were prepackaged and implement, implemented as is without taking into consideration local knowledge, local context, um, in terms of the setting, everything was different, these initiatives had failed. However, 
can you recognize approaches being done today that similar? Similar. If you think about development projects that you know of, if you think about um, agricultural strategies that you use for us. These things are a lot of, or <coughs> often still applied in the modernist way. Okay. Then the next one, and I think I'll end with that one. <laughs> okay, is the dependency one. So the dependency one was relevant uh, between 1960s and the 1980s. Now, this came about as a result of the critique on modernization, but the aim of this, which was not necessarily a um, conscious aim, um, is that Western countries kept developing countries um, dependent on them um, through helping them, through assisting in certain things, and by that means they got to influence certain processes. So Western countries um, could influence economic systems, and they could influence political structures within developing countries, um, and that created that, that dependency. So developing countries' context was still ignored. It was still ignored that people in developing countries have knowledge and <coughs> skill bad use of how many years to survive in certain um, And then countries would never develop if they stay dependent. So as soon as uh, the main um, country removed itself, the western country removed itself, everything was falling to pieces because they had that, this dependency. Um, it opened developing countries up for exploitation as well. So not necessarily, I don't want to Western evil, but um, I don't want to say that, but it wasn't necessarily always conscious. It was maybe with good intention. You know, we want to assist in this regard, and by doing this, a certain exchange um, relationship gets formed, and we do something away where it allows us to be dependent on other countries. Um, okay. Importantly as well as we're seeing this uh, to some extent today still, so you think about food aid in the one of Africa, that type of thing, people still being dependent on, on this aid. Um, it's also a contentious issue we can discuss it in generally one if we need that. Um, but there's a very interesting um, there's a very interesting uh, TED talk that I think I'm going to email you the name of and I'd like you to watch that when we come back before we come back next week. So that's not my assignment. I'll send you the link on your phone. Um, but this TED talk um, is an Italian guy that had worked um, in Africa for a lot of years. And he's seen these approaches to the things that they have done a lot. And it makes him angry. We know Italians have become very passionate. So it's, a, it's an interesting day to watch. I'd like you guys to watch that before we come back next week. Um, and then next week we look at the, uh, development in DRR. But before that, we'll look at the participating um, approach and how that functions. And then we'll discuss some of the other uh, aspects of the approach. Yes. Before we go, I'll make some
development is actually supposed to be decided by people surrounding it. Um, it's, it's supposed to be um, realized within the area, but what happens usually is development is decided for groups and for people. So it makes it difficult. So in that sense, yes, there's no, there's no set definition about for you, this means development, or a general one that can be applied. But we'll look at what might be um, uh, approach development and see why, why that's difficult to do. Why it's difficult to put down a specific one to three on the um, But for now, uh, it's important to realize that it's a process of change. There's, if we speak about that, it's something that's happening. It's a dynamic process that's moving. Um, and also, there's something else I want to say. Uh, oh, yeah. And also, of course, there's, there's lots of scholars. Um, especially uh, the scholar and the rest of the as well. We've done a lot of uh, studies on the anthropology of development and actually looking at is development necessary? And our whole discussion surrounding, you know, is it necessary to apply development theory in areas and implement development projects? Are people not existing as they choose to exist? So it's difficult. On that hand, we say now no, but there's certain issues that people cannot necessarily change within their specific environment that need um, different organizations and structures to actually um, influence and change that to make sure that they live safer, that they're in safer areas, that they are protected, and that they have opportunities. So it's a, it's a difficult discussion. A difficult discussion. Okay. Um, yeah. You guys are free to leave, <laughs> release, go out, enjoy your day. <laughs>